Welcome, and thank you for joining the Nutrient Stewardship for GHG Reduction in Af Africa webinar. To start some housekeeping notes, please uh, consider that the event is being recorded. When entering the call, please ensure your name appears clearly. Otherwise, use the rename function on the participants list. As of now, you're all muted, muted but we will activate your microphone if you're being uh, putting forward a question as we want the session to be as interactive as possible. Please raise your electronic hand if you wish to intervene. We also invite you to introduce yourself and share your notes in chat. We have measures in place to help maintain the integrity of the call, so should there be a disturbance, please bear with us and we'll restore order shortly. It is our hope that today's session will provide information and links uh, to resources available and spur you to accelerate empowerment of women and girls in the food system. My name is Clyde Graham, Executive Vice President of Fertilizer Canada, and I would like to acknowledge everyone here uh, today for taking the time to join this important discussion. We have an excellent panel today, and we look forward to a vibrant discussion. To start off the conversation, I would like to focus a video showcasing the 4R solution demonstration plots the outcomes from the year 2020. All right, well, thanks very much. I uh, uh, hope you uh, felt that that video was informative and I would just like to give, provide you with a few introductory uh, comments about our program, the Forest Solution Project uh, in, uh, in Africa. Just wanna make sure we see the slide there. All right. Okay, uh, is, I, is there a next slide there? All right, um, so the uh, For Our Solution Project is a uh, public-private partnership, which is funded by the government of uh, Canada and a number of companies in the fertilizer uh, industry. Our aim is to improve the lives of 80,000 smallholder farmers, half of them women, in uh, the countries of Ethiopia, Ghana, and Senegal. We've just finished the third year of a five and a half year project, and as Hopefully you can see from the demonstration uh, plot results that we have uh, that we've been making good progress in our aim to improve fertilizer use in those countries uh, to improve and empower the lives of uh, women in Africa uh, and to demonstrate the value and empower cooperatives to uh, provide uh, better outcomes for smallholder farmers who belong to those, uh, those co-ops. Um, you know, obviously, the fertilizer uh, marketplace is in a difficult state these days. Uh, obviously, we've had uh, significant market disruption over the last year, and that's only been made place by the very uh, unfortunate and uh, tragic uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, but we're here today to talk about uh, uh, greenhouse gas reductions. It's our view that uh, the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program 
can provide an opportunity for farmers in Africa and in fact around the world to reduce their emissions of nitrous oxide when they apply nitrogen fertilizer. And so we're going to go to our first uh, presentation. Bear with me one second here. Excuse me. Okay, to kick off the discussion, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote address on nutrient stewardship for GHG reduction in Africa from Dr. Guillaume Azui. Uh, Dr. Azui, also known as Guillaume, is a native of Togo, a consultant at Plant Nutrition Canada with a focus on four hour nutrient stewardship and greenhouse gas in Africa. Uh, he has an extensive experience working in the field of crop modeling and fertility management and plant nutrition in Sub Saharan Africa. He holds a PhD in plant productive systems from uh, in the Netherlands and an MSc in agriculture and environment engineering and a BSc in crop production at the University uh, of Lornay in Togo. Uh, he has had many previous roles with various organizations, including the African Plant Nutrition Institute, uh, the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and the International Fertilizer Development uh, uh, Center. So I'll pass over the, uh, uh, the uh, microphone to Guillaume. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Clyde, for the introduction. Uh, greetings, dear distinguished panelists and participants from all over the world. Um, I'm pleased to deliver this uh, keynote presentation on nutrient stewardship for green, greenhouse gas reduction in Africa. This presentation is inspired from the white paper entitled, Can For Our Practice Limits um, the Nitrous Oxide Emission from Increasing Fertilizer Use in Sub-Saharan Africa. I take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the support from uh, my co-authors, Ken, uh, Karen, Dan, Labonye, right, Samuel, Shemi, and Tom, um, for their great contribution. Next slide, please. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa agriculture faces major challenges uh, to sustainably meet food production needs. Projections indicate that the current population size will double by 2050, implying larger food demand, whereas current uh, production systems are constrained by large yield gaps resulting from depleted soils and unsustainable agricultural practices, including fertilizer use. However, uh, you know, however, um, appropriate nutrient management with adequate fertilizer use have proven to be essential in improving and sustaining uh, yield in many regions in, in the world, including in Africa. Thus, the nitrogen supply as an important driver for biomass production and yield. Uh, uh, a bit, it's a, a building block for sustainable food production through soil carbon buildup. And it is going to play a role, a key role in meeting it to a current and future food demand. However, nitrogen leakage is a major challenge uh, to coping systems and it's also of nitrous oxide emission, uh, which is a potent greenhouse gas and a significant contributor to global warming. So nitrous oxide emission is a, in the atmosphere is driven by two uh, main processes. Um, we're talking about the nitrification and the nitrification. Uh, nitrification is just the oxidation of ammonium to nitrate, nitrate then to nitrate, while the nitrification is the reduction of uh, nitrate back to denitrogen gas. Next slide, please. So uh, the use of uh, for our nutrient stewardship through the management of plant 
we train based on the right source at the right rates at the right time and the right place has proven to be effective in, in reducing interest oxides emissions from fertilizer applications. So it is not exclusively a fertilizer management program, but aim at uh, managing nutrients supplied by fertilizer, organic, uh, in, inorganic amendment, and biological nitrogen fixation. Next slide, please. So uh, in a recent uh, discussion paper, we assess the potential uh, impact of the adoption of our nitrogen for our on uh, nitrous oxide in sub-Saharan Africa by 20. 30 and 2015. After a first approximation using for our climate smart protocol, we use uh, FAO start projections of nitrous oxide emission from fertilizer out to 20, 2050. The for our climate smart approach uses a combination of uh, empirical research modeling and expert opinion to determine which and nitrogen management practice reduces nitrous oxide emissions. So if this uh, protocol was first developed for as I, it was developed as nitrous oxide emission reduction protocol in Canada and is globally scalable and has been endorsed by FAO as a climate smart agricultural practice. So they've projected uh, FAO uh, emission, FAO start projected emission were used as our baselines with an average uh, for 2015 to 2017 as the starting point. Then we use the projected emission uh, for 2030 and 2050 as a biz business as usual baseline for those years. So we use a bracketing approach uh, to compare for our adoption rate of 10 to 50 percent by 2050 and nitrate oxide emission reduction rates ranging from 5 to 25 percent. Next, please. Um, so here we present the results, uh, uh, the, the projected emission and the potential emission reductions in uh, nitrous oxide at different adoption rates of four practices in Sub-Saharan Africa by uh, 2030 and 2050. Uh, the results show that up to uh, about 12.5% 12, 12 nitrous oxide emission reduction can be achieved with the adoption of uh, the, the four hour practices. So this is considered uh, emission reduction that can help generate carbon offsets, uh, income, and high return to farmers to compensate their investment in four hour. Next slide, please. So uh, here I want to point out two fundamental elements toward enhanced implementation of uh, the four uh, best management practices for high uh, reduction of uh, nitrous oxide emission in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the first key element is to develop or adjust the four best management practices to local conditions. So this table is uh, fairly generic ranging from from basic to advanced BM based management practices performance levels, but it's um, it's it gives a it gives uh, a flavor of uh, the kind of practices that tend to reduce nitrous oxide emissions. So they can be adjusted to cropping system, region, climate, soil type, farmers, etc. That's what the Four Africa project has started achieving. In, uh, Ethiopia, Senegal, and Ghana. Next slide, please. So the second element element is uh, to focus on nitrous, uh, nitrate use efficiency to, to achieve economic and environmental benefits. So if more nitrogen is getting to the plants, less is likely to be lost to the environment. Uh, then yield and income will be positively impacted. So adopting the 4R 
will shorten the path to nutrient use efficiency value that are compatible with uh, sustainable intensification. Next slide, please. So to conclude, I want to say uh, that um, fertilizer will be indispensable in meeting the challenges of uh, sustainable crop production, climate change, and food security in Africa during the next 30 years. But that role will be played within uh, an, uh, an integrated system of uh, nutrient management. Adoption of far uh, nutrient stewardship has significant potential to reduce nitrous oxide emissions associated with uh, N fertilizer use in sub Saharan Africa. Adjusting the recommended best management practices to local conditions and focusing on practices that increase nutrient use efficiency are key to achieve this while also improving yields and income. Next slide, please. So we want to acknowledge uh, the four uh, partners. And if you have any questions or follow up after this discussion, feel free to contact uh, my colleagues from Fertilizers of Canada. Thanks for your attention. Well, thanks very much, uh, Guillaume, for your uh, excellent summary of the, uh, the paper. And I, I do encourage everyone on the uh, on the webinar to go and have a look at the uh, the paper in more detail, and of course we'll have uh, further discussion later on in our meeting today. So thanks very much, uh, Guillaume. I think it's important uh, that uh, despite some of the tremendously disturbing events that have occurred in the world over the last uh, year, uh, the uh, last couple of years, including the global pandemic and the uh, invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia, uh, that we cannot take our uh, minds also off the, uh, uh, the critical issue of uh, climate change. And uh, so I, I think the paper is still remains very timely at uh, this point uh, in the world's history. Um, so um, now I'd like to turn to our country managers who have been uh, doing the hard work of delivering for our nutrient stewardship or the for our solution in uh, Ethiopia and, uh, and in Ghana over the last uh, three years. So we're going to turn to Ethiopia and uh, Mr. Uh, Burhanu Amba. Uh, he is our country manager for CDF uh, Canada in Ethiopia. Burhanu works at the CDF uh, Ethiopia office as country manager, and he leads the implementation of our for our nutrient stewardship project there. With over 12 years experience in directorship of uh, various uh, NGOs, Burhanu has successfully led organizations uh, as, uh, from establishing Ethiopia to growing new business opportunities, strategic leadership, and building high performance partnership and teams that uh, contribute to impactful results. And we've certainly seen the impact of his work in Ethiopia. Uh, and so uh, Burhan has also designed and managed development projects in food security, agriculture, microfinance, climate change, child protection, shelter, and a, a number of other areas. So Burhanu, I'll uh, turn the, uh, the, the uh, microphone over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Clyde. Uh, my presentation focuses on, uh, in light of the white paper uh, that has been just presented, my presentation would like to highlight uh, the practices in Ethiopia. In, uh, contributing towards the reduction of uh, greenhouse gases. Sorry about the background noise. So please, next slide. So in this presentation, I will be uh, touching upon a brief uh, background about the project in Ethiopia. And also I would be touching upon the advantages of the 4R uh, based management uh, practices over the farmer's practice in the project area. And also finally, uh, uh, touch upon the adoption of the 4R nutrient stewardship by smallholder farmers leading to, as uh, indicated in the white paper, uh, what are the lead, what are the practices, practices that are leading to the potential reduction in the green, greenhouse gas emission. Next slide, please. 
So a bit of the background, uh, you all know, I uh, just contextualized this is to the Ethiopia case, uh, but the project is in Ethiopia, Senegal, in Ghana. So overall, it's uh, contributing to improvement in the lives of 80,000 uh, smallholder farmers, in Ethiopia case, 40,000. The strategies are the same across uh, the three countries. So yeah, next slide, please. So uh, in the, I will be uh, focusing on the strategy uh, number one, which is uh, contributing to the climate smart way of you know uh, adopting the FOR nutrient stewardship project. Uh, so in uh, highlighting that uh, aspect of the project, I would start with the design of how the FOR nutrient stewardship practice. Uh, and research and demonstration is set out in the research protocols and uh, how the practice is taking off in the project area. So as you know, as you see, we have uh, nutrient emission trials, demonstration plots, uh, for our validation trials, and also we have, you know, all the uh, uh, crops with uh, uh, and chickpea that are part of the North nutrient emission trials and also the demonstration or learning uh, sites. We have the numbers and it's quite a significant number of, you know, uh, uh, nutrient emission trials and demonstrations are going on in Ethiopia over the last uh, three years. Next slide, please. So it's just to give you the Project area, it's uh, the central uh, midlands uh, of Ethiopia, uh, the Amhara regional states. The project is being implemented and the district is uh, Minjar Shankora district, as you can see in the map. Next slide, please. So I would start uh, in contributing to the overall goal, uh, the uh, what we have been doing in terms of, you know, implementing the practices. And as you have seen, uh, the nutrient emission trials are the main part of the project activities. So uh, we have nutrient emission trials for wheat and nutrient emission trials for TEF. So in terms of, you know, uh, in line of the white paper, and in terms of, you know, the use of uh, and, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, and how we have been efficiently managing uh, the nitrogen. Uh, this wheat and uh, you know the TEF uh, trials. We have run a laboratory test uh, with, uh, in the third uh, cropping season, and the results are application of fertilizer increased and concentration of both grain and straw compared with the control in the project areas and also when it comes to TEF nutrient emission trial and the concentration of grain was increasingly increasing with the application of nutrient. So what we can conclude is uh, the effect of uh, N is visible in leading towards more precise management of uh, nitrogen, potential reduction of nutrition uh, nitrification due to for our nutrient stewardship practice followed of the nutrient emission trials. So as you can see, uh, the increasing adoption of the foreign nutrient stewardship has significantly, significant potential to the reduction of greenhouse effect emissions associated with the increased uh, in fertilizer use. Uh, so we have like the nutrient emission trials and the other part of the practice is we have the learning sites or the demonstration sites. So, uh, we have the learning sites on TEF well, uh, and the learning site on wheat as well. So we followed, uh, uh, there are two practices, the farmer practice and then the for our uh, best management practice, both for TEF and wheat as well. So as you can see, source and uh, uh, rate is more or less uh, across the country is given uh, in Ethiopia. So we follow uh, the source and rates, which is recommended. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, time and placement, that is where uh, 
uh, the localized practices are re really making uh, significant differences in the production and productivity. Next slide, please. So as you can see, the yield for uh, Sardir uh, cropping season from the learning side is uh, displayed in these two tables. Uh, the average type and wheat yield uh, dramatically increased for the second consecutive year. And the potential to avoid soil mining and nutrient loss uh, has also, to the environment, has also been really uh, reduced. So this is a good indication that, you know, the nitrogen use efficiency is there and uh, productivity has increased. And there is a good, uh, you know, uh, direction that the potential to avoid soil mining and uh, nutrient loss efficient uh, to the environment is really achieved in, uh, with this uh, production uh, yield improvement uh, in the cropping season. Next slide, please. Yeah, along with uh, tape and wheat, with uh, the third year introduced chickpea uh, in as a learning site and also as a precursor crop uh, in eight villages. So as you can as you can imagine, chickpea has a great dietary and uh, you know soil fertility potential. The best management practices are aimed at improving soil fertility and disease and pest control measures. One of the problems in the Minjar Shankara district where the project is implemented is chickpea is exiting the cropping system because of uh, a, a disease which has been there for a long period of time. So uh, with this project and introducing chickpea into the, into the mix of the crops, we are trying to really uh, contribute to the, you know, the uh, nitrogen use efficiency, as well as also uh, contribute to the problem. I mean, alleviating the problem in the area in terms of best, following best management practice to control both pest and uh, disease in the chickpea crop. So in addition to chickpea, introducing chickpea uh, and as a demonstration or learnings uh, crop, we have also on farm for our validation trials. Uh, so we have uh, we've introduced this in uh, uh, separate uh, project site so that we can uh, determine the rates uh, of uh, on you know wheat and teff and chickpea and lentils. And also we are following best management practices. Okay, all in all, potential for nitrogen fixation, improving soil, soil fertility, and manage uh, an application. That's the, uh, uh, the objective of uh, doing what this. Next slide, please. So, when it comes to a farmer's adoption of the 4R principles, uh, as clearly indicated in the white paper, uh, I think the advisable uh, strategy is to start at the basic level because uh, the basic level is really a good way of starting it off, especially when it comes to the uh, agricultural situation, the small polar farmer situation in Africa and Ethiopia, which is really subsistent. So starting it off at the basic level is really important. So uh, the adoption looks like, uh, you know, uh, farmers are understanding uh, is growing. Best management practices are optimizing. Farmers understanding the, uh, of the best management practice as optimizing nutrient yield, cost and objective of the cropping system. As we inter interact with the farmers, that's what we are getting uh, from the recognition of N as the most limiting and uh, increased practice to make efficient use of it. So, such as you know, during heavy rains and flash floods, farmers are now in the project area are really well aware of you know, the effect on N because of heavy rains and flash floods. So the management has really increased to really uh, deal with that. Farmers are able to compare the difference between their practice and the 4R practice recommendations. A large number of farmers participating with minimal disruptions to uh, the cropping system. So uh, all in all, you know, it's uh, uh, more than 80 
uh, farmers, households are participating in specifically the nutrient omission trials and in the learning site, uh, allocating their land. So it's uh, quite a number. Site specific fertilizer application, soil location, uh, weather, uh, you know, cultivars, economics, and management practice are part of, uh, you know, the variables that uh, farmers are uh, practicing with. Uh, nutrient deficiencies, deficiency symptoms, nutrient loss demonstrations are there uh, from time to time during training and during farmers field days. These are the major topics that are really covered in the uh, learnings uh, in the interaction with the farmers. Best planting windows, best fertilizer application windows are also you know, the major topics in uh, the cropping season. Uh, that the project and uh, the small order farmers are really uh, handling uh, as, a, as a learning. Uh, it's a participatory learning. Farmers are more aware of the economic, social, and the environmental sustainability of nu nutrient input and the crop requirement. Next slide, please. So, uh, in uh, in you know adopting the for our nutrient stewardship. Uh, uh, principles. Uh, those are the actors that are really actively uh, participating, the researchers, extension service, input suppliers, uh, cooperatives like the multi-purpose cooperatives, SACOs, uh, farmer to farmer, you know, those are those who are allocating their lands and the neighbors uh, are really interacting actively, policymakers, implementing partners, national advisory committee, uh, members and other NGOs are really also participating. So uh, this would, we believe, is facilitating uh, the adoption and dissemination of the learning in the for our nutrient stewardship. Next slide, please. So these are some of the witnesses uh, on the field. Uh, so uh, the particular farmer, Kokeb Asge, from the this Adama particular community, is talking about uh, his experience uh, saying we have applied white fertilizer or urea and have been have seen that the growth of crop is so rapid and grain quality is good with more grain heads the yield improvement is so obvious and we are aware of that applying the 4R increases yield and the other lady Alam Nagash from Irabati community is uh, also has a witnessing that she has been really participating, uh, saying, I've been provided with agriculture inputs uh, like fertilizer and equipment with, with basic business skill, leadership, assertiveness training, as well as credit facilities. These provisions have brought a substantial yield improvement on my farm and an additional income and livelihood improvement. Uh, so these are uh, some of the witnesses, uh, you know, the success stories and witnesses are so many uh, for the sake of time. Uh, I just quoted this too. Right. So I would wind up. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thanks very much, uh, Burhano. And, uh, you know, the uh, your team in uh, Ethiopia has done a great job of keeping the, uh, the project uh, running uh you know on schedule and delivering great results despite the pandemic and and uh, the unfortunate conflict in the north of uh of ethiopia so thanks very much for that uh, great presentation we're now going to go to uh ghana and uh christiana yakubu who runs our program there in ghana and will soon be leading our uh, third uh, country project in uh, Senegal, which is just starting uh, this uh, this spring. So, and Christiana is going to talk to us about some of the important uh, work that's being done to empower women women in uh, Ghana through the Four Solution Project. Uh, Christiana. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I am very pleased to be part of this webinar and my presentation is going to focus on the role that women farmers are also playing in reducing the nitrate oxide emission through their activities. Okay, so move on. 
So um, the first I would like to uh, mention is what our gender interventions are focused on. Why are we doing it and how is that going to reduce the nitrate emission? First of all, we want to increase the knowledge of the women farmers so that they will be able to adapt the four R principles and also want to increase their confidence so that they can actively participate in leadership and decision making. It is also important to realize that we want the women to increase their income because as they increase their income, they are able to make choices that can help them to pay. We also want to reduce the gender-based violence among the women. Next slide. Next slide. So what are the initiatives that as a project we have? No, please go back. What are the initiatives we have taken? First of all, once we are promoting access to finance and also use of time savings technologies, because we believe when they get this, then they should be able to uh, make choices that can really help us achieve this. The second thing is that we know knowledge about uh, extension or access to extension is critical. So as a project, we have also established the village or volunteer agents, extension agents model, where the farmers are able to get extension services at real time and also at their convenience. Another aspect is the gender model family um, structure that we have established, which we intend or which we are expecting that once uh, this model is well established, then it will also enhance in uh, balancing the rules at the family level and also increasing participation in decision making. Another core activity that we are doing under the gender unit is facilitating alternative livelihood sources which is aimed at also increasing their income that can also help them to have choices and also in that champion model where we have men who are advocating the rights of women and helping women to achieve. Next slide. So in the next slide, in the implementation of these strategies, what have we achieved? In the last year, you realize that women are quick adapters because they have the capacity, they have the information. Most of them were able to adapt the four art practices and they increase their productivity. We, and also most of them have access to finance through the village savings and loans and the loan fund. So they are able to uh, invest in their businesses, which gives them more income and they are able to do things that can improve their well-being the family and also practice the four our principles. We have the village volunteer, the extension volunteer model. See that all, every community has a, a volunteer who is a woman, who is able to support the farmers, to, especially the women farmers, to access extension information at the right time and at their convenience. As I speak to you, about 123 women have acquired various technologies. If you look at the labor, who are into the labor aspect, but with these technologies, we have planters, we have tricycles, we have treasures. It reduces the burden on the women and they are able to actively participate in activities that brings income to them. Very important achievement is their participation in leadership. If you go to the primary corp level, over 40% of the leadership are women. And the same way, if you get to the, uh, the next level, that is the zonal corp level, about 50% of the leaders are women. And they are actively participating their decision actively advocating for the rights of they have a very instrumental in the women accessing land to do their production and other activities. The last slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. 
Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, just to conclude, please, can we just have a look at the slide before? Yeah, the slide before you see, we, this is one of the alternative livelihood activities where the women are doing dry season gardening. To my right, you see an extension, a woman extension agent who is supporting a woman farmer in doing the writing on the farm. And you can also see the technologies on top, which uh, is bringing more income to the women. Yeah. Okay. So the, the last slide. So I would like to thank everyone for your attention and uh, if you have any questions and all our partners, I say thank you to everybody who have been able to participate here, Global Affairs Canada, who are the major funders of this project and all our partners. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christy. The job you're doing there is uh, terrific in uh, in Ghana. Uh, and so now we'd like to, and thank you, uh, Burhanu, as well, once again. Uh, it's it's the people on the ground in the countries who actually make things uh, happen for uh, uh, for the for the project. So we appreciate your hard work. Um, so we just write, like to run a short video that uh, provides uh, some more uh, information about uh, the, the successes of the project so far. We, the farmers in Jamba here, were wondering why we are not getting high and quality yield. And then the, this project came. Because formerly we were farming anyhow, without any principles. So for our project came and then start with uh, some demo farms to train us how to farm and get quality and more yield. So they make demo farms, they say the right way to get to a fertilizer and even the right way to, to, to start your farming, even the right land which you have to farm, and then the right source to get your fertilizer, right rate and the right time and the right place. So when we started, we learned that from the, the, the field, the demo fields. And this year, if I apply it to my farm, I think I will get more and quality yield. Before I learned about 4R, I didn't know there were specific herbicides for specific weeds and specific fertilizers for specific crops. But now, 4R has taught us to get the right source of fertilizer, the right time, the right weight, and the right place to apply the fertilizer. This year, I'll take my time to do the right thing. I will consult with the agriculture extension agents to support me so I can get better yields, sell it, and make enough money to take care of my children. My hope and expectation in these uh, four R principles is I am expecting that my life to change because if I apply the, the right principles, I will get more yield and sell. And if I sell, I will have money to help my family. Well, I, ho I hope you found that uh, video interesting. It's only an excerpt from a much lo longer video that provides a lot more uh, information and perspectives of farmers, uh, which the project is really uh, uh, all about. So we're now going to move into the question and answer uh, session. We'll, we have a time for very few uh, questions. So you can either raise your electronic hand and we'll recognize you, but keep your questions very brief. And we'll ask the panelists to uh, respond briefly as well. Or you can put your question into the chat. And keep in mind, if we don't get to your question, if it's in the chat, uh, we will, uh, during this session, uh, we'll address it uh, either in the technical uh, uh, session to follow or uh, uh, through our website. So does anyone have any questions for the, uh, for the panelists? See there's. So there's a question for uh, Christiana. Do you find that uh, using women extension workers is important to reach women farmers?
I'm not sure if uh, Christiana, are you online still? Yeah. Yes. So the question was. Yes, because if you look. Yeah. So what I was saying is that with the um, government extension agents in Ghana, they come at a time that sometimes the women do not have the time. But with the volunteer extension agents who are women, they understand the needs of the women. And once their capacity is built and they know what they need to tell their colleagues, their colleagues, their colleague women are just comfortable to work with, with them. So for me, I really think that it has worked for us because more women have had access to information and in a form that is um, friendly to them. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks, uh, Christiana. And um, uh, Guillaume, uh, I just wonder if you could uh, maybe give uh, some personal reflections on your work. Is there anything in taking on this project uh, that uh, uh, caused you uh, some reflection that you might not normally have had about uh, 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 agronomy in, uh, in Africa and the challenge of climate change? I think you're still on mute, uh, Guillaume. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Clyde, for, for the question. Uh, reflection on uh, some challenges uh, uh, across this work. Um, actually, uh, climate change is uh, really uh, affecting um, crop production in Africa, and a lot has been done uh, outside Africa on how to investigate and how to find uh, solutions. But uh, in Africa, uh, we are still uh, um, a bit behind. Uh, we actually are working together to uh, find solutions that can help the farmers. And the, the current work that uh, for our, uh, is doing in Africa is actually uh, very key to help find solutions to uh, the issues that are common uh, in the ground. Um, I don't know if I've covered what you asked or, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I think it's uh, always, you know, we, we tend to look at issues like climate change as from a global perspective in terms of millions of tons of CO2, but they are issues that affect the lives of individual people uh, uh, in Canada and, and, and throughout Africa and, and around the world. So it's interesting to have that uh, perspective. So um, I think we are running a little bit uh, short. Should we wrap up, uh, Robin? I uh, guess that's great. And we're spot on time again. Thank you. Okay. So we've uh, set aside uh, some time for uh, uh, closing comments from uh, Ms. Uh, Phyllis Menz, um, born in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, Phyllis Menz is the uh, alternate permanent representative uh, APR of Ghana to the United Nations uh, in Rome um, and uh, the Food and Agriculture uh, Organization. Um, and she has held this uh, position since October 2018. Prior to appointment to Rome, Phyllis was the head of the Agricultural Statistic Unit uh, of the Statistics Research and Information Director of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Accra, Ghana, where she worked for 23 years. Phyllis holds a Master of Science, University degree in Extension for Natural Resource-Based Livelihoods from the University of Reading in Berkshire, United Kingdom, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture uh, from the uh, University of Science and Technology in uh, Ghana. And she also owns, uh, holds a number of other certificates and honors. So uh, Phyllis, if we could get your uh, closing uh, uh, reflections, we'd appreciate that. 
Thank you, Clyde. I'm grateful to the organizers of this nutrient stewardship program and for the opportunity given a representative of Ghana to participate in it. The last time Ghana was invited, Her Excellency Ambassador, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Ghana, Mrs. Yudora Kwote Kranton participated. The invitation was such a great honor to her. She was also very much impressed with the four R's and she kept on memorizing it, applying the right source of fertilizer, using the right rate at the right time of the year and right place. Anytime we entered the office, we had to memorize, I mean, she, memorized, she tried to memorize it. And you know, it was something that we thought was very laudable. Once again, thank you, Mr. Moderator, for inviting me to speak at today's event, focused on the findings of the study conducted by the Africa Plant Nutrition Institute and its partners on the reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions in the nutrient management. I also thank the speakers before me for their valuable contributions. Let me also take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the authors of this report and for conducting this study, which comes at a time when the world is looking for ways to make food systems more sustainable and to improve food security and nutrition. The world today is facing a complex moment where the challenges posed to our global food systems and food security by climate change are further compounded by the geopolitical crisis we see in faraway countries such as Ukraine and Russia. It is for this reason that we in Ghana are deeply appreciative of the investment in the 4R program. This investment proves the stewardship and nutrient proves that stewardship and nutrients are essential to nourish crops and provide food security. This is vital to improve the nutrition and well-being of our people and those around us. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, climate change affects women and men differently. Women involved in agriculture and food systems are extremely vulnerable in areas where the impacts of climate change are felt and have inadequate resources or coping mechanisms to address these impacts. Investing in the 4-hour program supports gender empowerment by focusing on equal access for women and help to reduce the impact of climate change. I also want to acknowledge the work of cooperatives that are involved in the 4 r program as these allow both men and women, smallholder farmers to work together to grow and supply nutritious food successfully. This study proves that good stewardship also provides social, economic, and environmental benefits. We know that to, assure, to ensure food security in Africa and the wider world, we must transform food systems to become more sustainable and efficient. We must produce more food with less impact on our environment. The 4R program allows us to improve our food security. It also helps us to produce nutritious crops and simultaneously address climate change. This is therefore a step in the right direction. I thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Menz. We really appreciate those uh, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful comments. Um, so we're about to head into a more technical session. We understand that some of the representatives to the FAO uh, may have to attend uh, an important meeting about uh, some of the current uh, issues facing the world. And so uh, we appreciate your participation if you have to go on to uh, those kinds of uh, duties. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Shami Zunguri, 
uh, who will be leading our technical conversation uh, about the white paper. And I, and I think Tom Brosma had a question uh, related to the white paper and Tom will, will ask you to pose that during the technical uh, session. So uh, Dr. Zinguri is Director of Research and Development. Hi. For, yes. And my apologies for interrupting. Um, Shami has just flagged that he has lost connectivity. He was on the line with us a few moments ago. Sure. He's working to get it back. So he has asked Samuel to step in. Hey, terrific. Sorry about that. We're, we're just having a few people seem to be having some line issues. Um, and we are just trying to sort the back end of that out. Sure. So, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll still introduce uh, Shami, and if he can rejoin us, that's great. Uh, and then we'll uh, turn over to uh, Samuel, who is uh, Shami's uh, colleague. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, Shami uh, is at the uh, headquarters of the African Plant Nutrition Institute, which is uh, in Ben Gurir in Morocco. He's leading research uh, programs focusing on the development and promotion of innovations for sustainable plant nutrition management uh, through research, education, and outreach. Prior to joining the African Plant Nutrition Institute, Dr. Zangori was director of the Sub Saharan African program for the International Plant Nutrition Institute. And uh, he worked on many uh, regional programs in uh, Africa uh, on behalf of the uh, Institute. Um, and so uh, Samuel is uh, uh, a colleague of Cheney. Samuel has actually done a lot of our uh, work on the ground in both uh, Ethiopia and Ghana. So he's an excellent uh, uh, stand in for Shami until uh, hopefully Shami can uh, rejoin uh, us. Um, and uh, uh, Samuel also works with the African uh, Plant uh, uh, Institute uh, in, uh, but I think you're, uh, Samuel, you're headquartered in uh, Kenya. So uh, Samuel, if you could uh, take uh, control of the floor and we'll move into the technical session. And as Samuel comes on the line, if we could just ask if Askia could identify themselves by raising their hand. Um, Askia, you may be labeled as a vent guest or we may have lost your connection. We lost about four people all at once. Sorry for the technical issue. Okay. So Samuel, if you could focus on questions for Guillaume right now, Guillaume has a stable uh, connection. So if you could start with the, um, the Guillaume questions first. Sure. And uh, I can help uh, Samuel in that we do have a question from uh, Tom Brosima. Uh, and I'll just, Tom's typed to the chat. Tom Brosima is with Plant Nutrition Canada and is also a former scientist with the uh, International Plant Nutrition Institute. Uh, uh, Guillaume, could you provide some more background on how the description of the basic, intermediate, and advanced for our practices were developed? Are they specific to regions and cropping systems? And uh, who all needs to provide input into these? Um, OK, uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, in fact, uh, the methodology used to develop uh, these uh, um, uh, practices is based on um, the uh, climates, uh, the four climate smart protocol uh, that was uh, developed uh, in, in Canada, but which is also uh, glo globally scalable. So uh, that protocol. Uh, uses a combination of uh, uh, empirical uh, research, modeling, and expert opinion uh, to determine which uh, nitrogen management practices uh, reduce nitrous oxide emissions. So, um, so these become the kind of uh, best management practices uh, of the for us for like for the source, the rates. Uh, the time and the place. So, uh, so this is what is used as a, a business as a usual. And so, the 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 best management practices are developed using uh, different um, scales uh, levels. So you have the basic, 
uh, you have the intermediate and the advanced. So those are designed uh, so that based on the condition in the location where you are and the capability of uh, uh, the farmers, so they can go with the one that uh, suits their uh, situation, for instance, or the region, or uh, the climate, uh, uh, the local condition in general. Yeah, so like for, for Africa condition, we cannot expect uh, for a, a very low resource indoor farmers to go with the advance, but we may start targeting the basic where uh, we can, you can use the locally available uh, sources and so on to be able to uh, adopt the for r and have a significant impact. Yeah, so they are not uh, specific to one location. Uh, it is adjustable to the situation or the condition uh, of the farmers that we are working with. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here's another question that's come into the chat. And if Samuel, if you don't mind, uh, uh, you know, I'd like you to intervene as well uh, in terms of answering. Is there a need for the mapping of soil fertility to effectively meet the benefits uh, or provide the benefits of the 4R uh, approach? Uh, maybe Samuel, you might want to respond to that. Sure. Thanks very much, Clyde. And I think that's uh, an important question because, uh, and the first answer, quick answer is, is yes, this need for mapping of soil fertility so as to effectively meet the benefits of the 4R approach. Because uh, what you want to do with 4R approach, basically you want to enhance the efficiency of all the nutrients that are available. Not only those that are applied by the fertilizer, but also those that are also available in the soil. And different soils in different areas will have a different content of available nutrients. So it's important to know what's, for example, already available in the soil so that then you know how much you need to apply. And this then informs uh, your source because your source of fertilizer determines the nutrient composition. So if you know that in this soil, maybe potassium is not limited, then probably a source that does not have a pot potassium, maybe an NP combination may be su suitable. Also with regard to the rate. So if you, you are dealing with soils which uh, have relatively good content of you know, phosphorus, then this means that part of what your crop needs, if you are doing a maize crop or a wheat crop, maybe part of what the crop needs can be supplied by the soil. So this means that you can adjust your fertilizer rate for this specific area by taking into account what is already being provided by the soil. So, and we know based on the soil as the parent soil material that forms, forms soils in a different area, soils will be different. Also based on how farmers in the same area have managed their soils over time. If you have farmers who have been fortunate enough to have access to large amounts of manure or fertilizers. So such farmers will find that their soils will be, the fertility will be different even to neighboring farmers who maybe have not had the, the opportunity to apply say manure or large quantities of fertilizer. So the, the source and the rate then has a difference. So it's quite important to map soil fertility. Thank you. Well, there's an interesting question that's come in from the chat, uh, uh, and it's a challenge, I think, everywhere. Uh, uh, the, the question wants to you to comment on how farmers can actually know whether their nitrogen loss is being reduced or not. Is there any indicator or simple instrument uh, to, uh, uh, to essentially measure that at the field level? At the field level, especially in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, where we are mostly doing this work, there may not be any quick instruments, but uh, there, are, there are definitely some sort of indicators that you can use to assess whether you know, your losses are higher, are increasing or decreasing. So for example, you know, things to, like uh, nutrient deficiency symptoms are often a, a good uh, indicator. In Ethiopia, where we are working in some of the areas, you know, some of the highland areas where we usually have very high rainfall, it's common to see that uh, even following a nitrogen application, if you have incidences of very high rainfall, you know, in a few weeks, you are with crops, the leaves, the lower leaves are turning yellow, showing the classic signs of nitrogen deficiency. So this shows you that you are, you know, you're still having a lot of losses. And this is why then the advice uh, in some of these systems 
is to mostly work on the timing component of the four hours, where even if uh, the knowledge is that uh, you need to apply, say, about 120 kilograms of nitrogen, then split applications are recommended so that then you manage your losses. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, you have some, some that of N applied at uh, planting, and then the rest two that's then it's split into two top dressing applications while also taking, you know, adjusting this for current weather conditions. For example, based on the four practices, some of the recommendations are that even if the protocol says that you need to apply your top dressing fertilizer at uh, 45 days at, after planting, if at 45 days after planting, it's raining very heavily, the advice is not to apply because whatever you apply, most of it will be washed away and lost. So it's also taking in this local, uh, some of these local environmental conditions into, into you know, in, as part of your decision-making process. And in this way, also yield is a, is a, is a good indicator of uh, your efficiency improvements because if, for example, you are applying two bags of uh, MPS, two bags of urea, and then uh, your yields were, were low, and now based on the adoption of certain improved power practices, you're getting better yields, that shows that the crop is able to take up more, more of what you have applied, so there's more efficiency. So there are some indirect ways through how this can be determined. Thank you. Uh, Guillaume, do you want to add something uh, on this topic? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they are sometimes very simple things to do uh, in uh, improving the understanding of farmers on different type of fertilizers. Uh, for instance, very simple uh, test would be like uh, taking um, uh, urea, for instance, taking urea and leaving it on the sun and then ask the farmer to observe. Uh, and then like after some time, uh, go back and see how uh, it's liquefied and then it starts reducing. So this is a simple way to tell the farmer that if, for instance, you apply your fertilizer on the surface without covering it, it volatilizes. So it's a way that you are losing your nitrogen. So, I mean, they, they are, it's difficult to actually measure, mm -hmm. but uh, this is a way. And also, like Samuel said, mm -hmm. uh, the impact of, on the yields, the yields is, is because of the loss that you, uh, the farmer is not able to achieve higher yields. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I think uh, in Canada, our experience has been that measuring green, uh, nitrous oxide is extremely uh, difficult and expensive. Mm -hmm. While nitrous oxide is three, roughly 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2, um, the quantities that actually come off the field are very, very small and hard to measure. And Dr. Mary Tenut at the University of Manitoba is a pioneer in this area. And uh, you know, I, I believe the, the setup that he has to monitor one field costs uh, $300,000 uh, Canadian just to set up. So the, the challenges of, uh, of measuring are uh, universal, uh, not just in, uh, in Africa. So we have some other questions in the chat. There's one question about, uh, can the four R's uh, related to uh, greenhouse gas, can they incorporate other um, beneficial management practices such as the use of organic uh, 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 fertilizers or uh, conservation uh, practices? William, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, well, it can really uh, be integrated uh, because now um, the implementation of uh, for us uh, requires all goods uh, management practices, including uh, in conservation, agriculture, or organic farming. So, so the focus is not really just on mineral fertilizers, no. Uh, the focus is on uh, nutrient management. So whatever the source of uh, nutrient is, either organic, uh, biological, nitrogen fixation, uh, deposition. So all are considered. The, 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 the point is to make sure that uh, this nitrogen is uh, managed in efficiently so that uh, uh, the losses are limited. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah. So there's another question here about, um, it's, I think it's referring to, it refers to legacy uh, nutrients, but I think that's residual soil nutrients. And how do you deal when you're uh, trying to um, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, and, taking, and, and yet taking into account the residual soil nutrient levels? question you mean uh, i'm trying so, to capture the question is not very clear yeah. is it part in the is it in the chat box it, it is i i think the question if i interpret the question it's it's that uh um how do you account in uh, measuring uh the performance of the four r's uh take into account the, the, the nitrogen or other nutrients that were in the soil from the previous year and are left over in the soil in uh, making sure that you are uh, utilizing nutrients efficiently. Okay, that, that's quite correct. And, uh, so one of the things uh, that we, we do through the basics of uh, any four program that we try to help farmers incorporate is that a key starting point is a characterization of the farming system or the cropping system in a particular region. So that, uh, and then the idea behind this is that you want to get a good understanding of uh, what practices do farmers use. For example, do they practice monocropping of a, one cereal crop throughout, or do they have rotation of maybe a cereal crop and a legume crop that is able to fix some nitrogen? And also, what are, what other nutrient sources do they use? Do they have access to manure that they have they can apply? And it's based on this that then we're able to develop uh, four practices that are adapted to certain localities. Because while the principles of four R's are the same globally, how you apply them differs from one location to another, based on the cropping system and the farming systems that are there. So, if uh, you know in a certain system the there's awareness that uh, there's, for example, a rotation system where you have a groundnut crop coming before a maize crop. You do expect that uh, there's some benefit uh, from having your groundnut crop, which uh, is able to fix some in, and also some of the residues coming from this groundnut crop would, would provide some uh, level of nitrogen. And this is where then uh, this the advice to account for what you expect the contribution of the previous crop or whatever was applied previously. Uh, when you're now you're making your recommendation for for the, the cereal crop and part of what we are trying to do because there's been oh, perhaps we've lost tough trials which uh we want to see how best they can for example if your previous crop was a chickpea or or your previous crop was lentil how does that influence on the your fertilizer requirements for for TEF in the pollen lowing season or for wheat. So we, we started last year with the trials where we, we, we started with chickpea and lentil as the main crops. And now this season we are coming in to bring in wheat and or TEF and at different rates, at maybe half rate, full rate, zero rate, and 150% of the recommended to see how this, how much then we, we, we are able to benefit from the previous. But also having said that for elements such as nitrogen, which is of the key concern for this, you know, in, in line with our discussions today and, and in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the rates in Africa at the moment are still uh, pretty low and uh, being a very mobile nutrient. In most cases, you, you know, they are, they, you don't expect a lot of uh, strong residual effect. So from the whatever was uh, available from the past season. So the, the nutrients that you mostly have a strong residual effects uh, will mostly be your phosphorus and uh, potassium, which are not very mobile in the soil, and they tend to last longer in the soil. So there are those two aspects that you can manage based on what has been applied and what has been grown. But also there's the, that aspect that uh, specifically for nitrogen is mostly easily lost from the soil. So in most cases, you don't get a very strong residual effect for nitrogen. Thank you. Guillaume, here's a question I think you could handle uh, effectively is that, uh, it's about the focus on nitrogen in uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction programs. And obviously nitrous oxide comes from the nitrogen fertilizer, but what role do the other, uh, getting the application uh, practices for the other nutrients, including uh, obviously phosphorus and uh, potassium, how important is it to get those right as well as uh, the nitrogen uh, fertilizer? 
Hey, uh, thanks for the interesting question. Uh, in fact, we, it, it, it seems that we are focusing on nitrogen because uh, nitrogen is the one that catalyzes uh, uh, this uh, reaction of uh, nitrification and denitrification that is causing uh, the emission of uh, nitrous oxide. But equally, the other nutrients are also important. So um, because the 4R uh, try to balance all the nutrients, right? So uh, any disequilibrium that you will be creating in the soil will increase also the emission of nitrous oxide. So the supply of uh, phosphorus and potassium and micro, uh, micronutrients, all that are also equally important. At the same time, it's also important to ensure that there is no other limiting factors that contribute uh, to, to, uh, to uh, increasing the, the release of uh, nitrous oxide. So mm -hmm. there is no doubt that all that are actually con considered in the four R practices. Thank you. Sure. Maybe but just to further back up uh, Leon's yeah. point, I think uh, it's important uh, because uh, what happens, uh, you know, there are synergistic effects that uh, happen when you jointly provide uh, the various nutrients. For example, the application of phosphorus or the availability of phosphorus is known to enhance the uptake of nitrogen. You know, so the idea like uh, Guillaume has mentioned is that uh, these other nutrients also need to be provided so that they're not limiting because uh, based on, uh, you know, uh, you know there, there are clear scientific laws that have shown that uh, plant growth is mostly, is often limited by the nutrient that is available in the most limiting amount. So for example, if you provide sufficient nitrogen, say 150 kilograms, but then you don't, you provide very little phosphorus, then the crop can only grow as much as, uh, based on as much phosphorus as it, it can take up. So that crop growth will be limited and the crop will therefore not be able to take as much nitrogen as it would have wanted because its growth has been limited by the low availability of phosphorus. So then your losses will be higher. That means that then when you strike a good balance for all the nutrients, you are directly also or indirectly enhancing your nitrogen use efficiency because your crop has you know, more growth vigor and more ability to take up the nitrogen that you have applied. So it's critically important as we look to address uh, nitrogen or you know, emission, nitrous oxide emission that we also ensure balanced supply of the other nutrients. And that's why the, the whole four nutrient stewardship concept is not uh, revolves around the whole spectrum of nutrients that are essential for crops for good growth and production. Thank you. Yeah, here's a question. And I, I don't know if, uh, Phyllis, if you're still available, I might actually pose this question to you, uh, but also uh, uh, Guillaume is, um, you know, what role would these kinds of reductions uh, in greenhouse gas mean for Africa's commitments uh, to the, you know, to the Paris Accord and and uh, uh, the global movement on climate change. Well, there's. Folks. Thank you. I've been off and on, but um, you know, in Africa, we have issues with them. Um, with soils, I mean soil nutrient, I mean soil um, depleting soils, because we keep cultivating on the same land all the time, and so after a while, the the soils are not very good, you know, don't produce very good yields, and so this whole concept of um, having um, improved soil fertility. As you already know, it enhances our production and um, will go a long way to help us in every aspect, in every aspect of um, the lives of people. It will help us with them um, to achieve a target of zero hunger by year 2020. I mean, once we have increased yields and uh, um, improved generally improved productivity, we will be good to go. 
I, I think that's a great answer. Um, Gil, can you maybe talk a little bit about the, the, the potential in total for mitigation of greenhouse gas using the four R's in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, well, the uh, potential lies in the fact that um, uh, if increased adoption of uh, the, the four R practices, for instance, uh, there is the potential to reduce significantly uh, the estimated uh, N2O emissions. And um, this can contribute to, to um, uh, saving uh, carbon money uh, because there are offsets, carbon offsets uh, related issues there uh, for Africa if we uh, we, we manage to uh, to reduce uh, N2O emissions. It means that um, um, we are actually contributing to reducing uh, um, uh, the carbon the carbon uh, uh, the the carbon dioxide that is actually also a, a, a way to measure the way. Um, uh, greenhouse gases uh, affects the the, the 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 climate. So for Africa, is uh, uh, the the carbon offset is a way for the for for Afi Africa uh, to to get a revenue from the efforts put in uh, uh, adopting for R and the financial implications that go along with it. Okay, well that's that's great, excellent. Uh... Excellent answers all around, and you know, um, I, I think the the fundamental question for me is simply, you know, how can we help Africa achieve the other SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and and still uh, ensure that it's uh, able to make a contribution to the world's aims on uh, uh, reducing climate change, which is you know, I think a a critical. E e uh, issue for everyone. Uh, I don't know if uh, Botang is on the uh, on the line from Ghana, from 4-H Ghana. Uh, if, uh, I, you know, I, I think we, in our project, we've talked a lot about uh, women uh, and gender and, uh, but, you know, when it comes to issues like climate change, I really feel that uh, it's the young people of uh, Africa uh, who need to have a greater say in how these issues are uh, are managed because they're the ones that will uh, uh, that will inherit uh, the world and and uh, and lead us uh, in the future. So, uh, Boateng, are you on the line? Boat. Well, I see. There's uh, uh, it, it will come in when you can, uh, Boat, if you can. I also see there's a uh, question. Uh, yes. I think Boat has raised his hand. He's ready to come in, he just needs to unmute. Okay, terrific. Boat, if you can unmute. Oh, there you are, I'm sorry, Boat. Maybe having an issue with his sound, but he does want to take the floor. Please bear with us for one moment. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, uh, boats uh, team yeah. they are boat. Go, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Yeah, thank you so much. And so glad to be part of this wonderful conversation. Uh, in relation to the issue of attaining some of the sustainable development goals and then hunger and also supporting the, the green climate as well. 4-H Ghana, working with young people in, in Ghana, work with the 4-Hour projects, and we work with 1,200 young people, and we're able to reach out to smallholder farmers of about 3,000 people across the country. I must say that uh, the 4-Hour has become a global soil nutrient management processes that need to be enhanced. What was so phenomenal about the project that we did is about how these young people who majority of them have decided 
not to do agriculture or to do anything about agriculture has now begun to change their minds to uh, engage in some productive agricultural programs. And this has gone a long way to also affect their parents who are more or less a smallholder farmers in the various communities that we work. Using the principle and tilling gardens at school and at home, working on uh, uh, tiles and uh, containers that we, we taught them. It is so interesting to know that these small things can go a long way to ignite very positive programs that can sustain the agriculture in Ghana. I think many of us, especially those of us from Ghana knows that uh, the trend of replacing or getting people to go into the agriculture has become a very big challenge because gradually Ghana is urbanizing and many young people after completing school move to the, 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 the big cities. So one of the greatest strategy that I think we need to look at is to how we can get these young people who constitute the majority of the population segment to begin to look at how they can uh, integrate or participate in these agricultural programs. What we've been telling the kids is that, yes, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an economist, but please remember that you have a role to play in tilling this land so that you can teach your fellow brother or sister or your parents and transferring knowledge from the school or the community to the smallholder families have been so phenomenal. And I think that the four hour program has a long way to go to trying to use the young people who are the majority, let me say, in, in our emerging countries, especially in the sub saharan Africa, we know we have a very strong youthful population. And if we want to guide the, the environment and get the sustainable goal, development goals achieved, I think there is no way we can leave these young people behind to achieve that goal. We are grateful and I think that uh, we will continue to propagate. And currently we're working with the Ministry of Education and the uh, Department of Agriculture, the various districts and regions that our projects are being uh, uh, implemented. We're grateful to Fertilizer Ghana, uh, Canada and the Global Affairs Canada for the support. And we think that our program is going a long way and we're sharing with other for each African network programs and very soon we'll see the rolling effect of the 4-hour in some African countries that are working on the 4-H uh, methodology. I think this is what I can say for now. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm, you say you're grateful. I'm impressed by the success of that project, which had, you know, frankly, not very much funding and how 4-H Ghana was able to uh, produce some tremendous uh, results and engage so many uh, young people positively. I think it's just one of my favorite parts of the whole for our solution project. So thanks very much both for that, uh, that summary. Um, we do have a question. I think it's, it's, it's essentially related to drought conditions. Um, and uh, I'll let anyone who wants to uh, comment step in, but how do you manage nutrients within the 4 hour system with respect to moisture stress during critical stages of crops while avoiding, uh, I guess it'd be nutrient deficiencies. And you know, drought is a, is a challenge and it's probably gonna become more of a challenge as we uh, face uh, climate change. So I'll let anyone who wants to contribute pop in. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, an important question, especially you know, uh, in the current times that we are living in, we are seeing more you know, climate variability in, in a lot of areas we work in across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, we are seeing incidences of when uh, rain's not coming when they expected to come, or you know when they come, it's over a shorter period of time with a much higher intensity. So there's much there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, this then, as as part of the four-hour approach, then the the way we we tried 
the, the, the approach is designed is that it's not a, you know, it's an adaptable approach whereby, you know, farmers get training, for example, that uh, while there may be, there are certain periods during crop growth when it's advisable to apply your, especially a top dressing fertilizer, because this is the area where you'd be facing moisture stress for the crop. So it's not, then the training is, is to show that uh, you also need beyond the crop getting to a certain crop growth stage, or maybe passing a number of days or weeks after planting, then the decision to apply what you need to apply is additionally based on other metrics locally, you know, that you can, for example, has it recently rained? Is the soil moist? Because if, for example, it's, a, it's at six weeks after planting, say, for example, in maize, and the idea is that you should top dress your fertilizer at six weeks after planting, but then in the past two weeks, it has not rained, conditions are very dry then uh, the, the, the advice is that hold off your application and then wait for a few more days. Maybe it's going to rain the next few days. But then there is a challenge then that now this crop uh, is already now facing challenges with moisture stress. But again, now it may have further challenges with nu nutrient deficiency. And that's why also then your, your application at BASO becomes important and also the rate that you apply because uh, we've, and also the balance of nutrients that you apply because a lot of research has shown that uh, you know crops that are, have balanced fertilization right from the start uh, especially where uh, nutrients like potassium have been provided they have a better chance of uh, enduring uh, drought conditions and coming through moisture stress compared to crops that are facing challenges uh, with the uh, nutrient, you know, they didn't have sufficient nutrients applied. So this is partly one of the ways that uh, by ensuring that right from the start, the crop is uh, provided a good balance of uh, nutrients that it requires so that it, it stands a better chance that, you know, during the, the, the season, if there are incidences of uh, drought, it, th that crop has a better chance to withstand moisture stress. But there are, of course, certain severe situations where you know, you may have total rain for failure across the season, and sometimes uh, you may not uh, be able, to, the farmer may not be able to avoid these scenarios. So the advice then is, if, for example, you get to the middle of the season, you're supposed to add your top dressing fertilizer, but it's clear that, you know, there's no rain coming, there are no rains expected, it's probably best then to spare your fertilizer application and hold it for the next season. Because if you apply, then you're not getting going to get a good return because the crop is not, if the conditions are very dry, the crop is not able to take up the nutrients that are applied because most of the nutrients, they need to be mixed up in the soil water solution for the roots to be able to effectively take them up in a solid form. So even the decision to not apply is part of uh, the, 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 the forward practice that you want to ensure the timing is right. So if this season proves to be like in a sense, a, a, a very poor season in terms of rainfall, it's best to conserve what you have remaining of your fertilizer for the next season. Thank you. So, so here's a question uh, that I think is sort of in the climate smart agriculture vein. You know, how can 4R support more women to build resilience uh, to climate change? And of course, resilience is one of the three pillars of climate smart agriculture along with uh, mitigation and uh, adaptability. So I'm just wondering if uh, uh, Phyllis and maybe Christy, Christiana Yakubo, if you're still available, if you would maybe comment on that related to the particular challenges of uh, resilience uh, and uh, how for our solution might be able to address that. Perhaps Phyllis has uh, left. Uh, Christiana, are you there? I'm just waiting for your link to. Thank you very much um, for that great insight. Actually, for the smallholder farmers, for now, I can say that they understand. But it means to get the right nutrient for yourself. Maybe the, the technology for application, we are hopeful that we are able to get planters that will also 
yeah, especially the placement and the, the rates. So that's what we are hoping for. Otherwise, now management system. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, Christiana, we actually kind of lost your comment there, but your same signal seems to have cleared up. Could you just repeat your answer again? I'm sorry to do that to you. Okay. So what I was saying is that when it comes to the knowledge um, about the new trends, Oh dear, it looks like Christiana works. Yeah. Uh, so Christiana, I think we're just not getting your uh, the challenge is the mode. My my connectivity is not very good. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Too bad. Yeah, that now it sounds well, we'll take one more try. And if we can't get you, then perhaps you could just put a brief answer in the chat box for everyone. I'm sorry, I think we've lost you, Christiana. If you can hear me, if you would just put a brief answer in the chat, we'll I'll read it out on your behalf. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if uh, Phyllis Menz, are you still on the line? Okay, well, we'll, um, I, I mean, I, I think uh, that, um, you know, uh, this is an important question. Our project hasn't focused a lot on sort of climate resilience, uh, but uh, I think there's important work to be done there in the, uh, in the future. But obviously, the more uh, empowered women are, and the more access they have to... Uh -huh. I think Christiana, we're just not going to be able to get your uh, your comment in. If you could add it to the chat, that would be that, that would be great. Um, so let, there are a number of other uh, questions. I think we'll have to move on. We can maybe try and address that uh, later. Um, I think the issue, we talked a, a little bit about organic uh, uh, fertilizer, et cetera, but you know, the, uh, the question of traditional farming methods uh, and, and the 4R system, I just wonder if uh, maybe Guillaume and, and possibly Sama, you could just comment a little bit about the desire for people to maintain traditional ways of doing things versus the 4Rs. Is, is that a real conflict? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, uh, we notice that uh, in Africa, um, the uh, tra traditional way of uh, farming uh, has, has proved some some limits. Um, uh, for instance, the the way uh, land preparation is is done, um, the way uh, fertilizer use. Uh, is uh, applied or fertilizer is applied uh, the way uh, crop residue is managed. So all these are uh, uh, have some so some limitations, right? So the 4R uh, is actually promoting uh, um, practices that support the the good man good management practices that support. Uh, the limitation of uh, the loss of nutrients. Yeah. So um, they, uh, we are not saying here that all the traditional practices are bad, no. But there are some uh, few uh, improvements that, that are required to, to match uh, the recommendation uh, from the for our practices. Yeah. Thank you. Samuel, did you want to add to that? Yes, I'd like to, to add this and say that actually, as the name suggests, you know, for our nutrient stewardship, mm -hmm. it's really about nutrients uh, and not solely about fertilizer. So when we are, you know, the, so the 4R approach includes all sources of nutrients that are available to the farmer, including organic manures, including compost manure. And what we try, the message we try to pass along during and that's why it's an adapted practice that what may work in one area is not necessarily what will be required in another area. 
So as, as a first step during in, in any new area we are working on is to first of all to characterize the, the farming system to identify how do they what are the practices they use uh, do they have what are the, the their nutrient sources do they have uh, access to manure and then based on that then we work with the farmers to come up with an improved crop and nutrient management system that is based on the foils because even if it's about manure there are ways that you can enhance you know the efficiency of your manure that you are applying there are ways that if for example you store it better prior to applying on the field you're able to reduce the losses of nutrients so that by the time you're taking it to the farm it still has a considerable amount of nutrients available even in terms of applications for example when for mineral fertilizers you can really apply them the same time you are planting and then the nutrients are readily available if it's manure then the advice is often to apply them the right time for application would be for example two weeks before planting during land preparation because the manure needs some time for the nutrients that are held there to, to dissolve and become available to the plant so there are all those issues to do with that what was the right timing for example for manure in terms of rate also the rate that you we require to meet a certain supply of say nitrogen or phosphorus is different if you're using manure or fertilizer because uh fertilizer has more concentration of nutrients so the, the, the way we work it out is also to advise farmers for them to get, get a good understanding that if you're using manure, these are then the quantities you require to use. And also if the quantities are not enough, then there are options to integrate because fertilizer use alone is not uh, sufficient to deliver a sustainable system because we know also organic resources like manure, they provide other beneficial uh, services like improvement of soil structure, improvement of the water retention capacity that mineral fertilizers will not be able to provide. So an integrated approach works best, but then uh, in some areas you do find that uh, there are no options for that integrated approach because maybe there's no opportunity to access manure. So then what fertilizer become your best bet. So the four-hour approach uh, in essence really incorporates all those aspects depending on what is available for a particular farming system. Thank you. Well, thanks, Samuel. I think uh, Askia may have been able to rejoin, um, and I don't know whether you've been able, if you are there, raise your hand, I think, and uh, if, uh, you know, if you've been following the conversation, uh, but I, I'd just like to give the floor to you to make some comments, uh, since you've not been uh, able to participate until now. We'd like to hear your perspective. Good morning. Oh, it's afternoon, yes. Uh, yes, I joined halfway and the conversation has been well presented, especially the first thing that has been uh, 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 we're having uh, trouble with your signal, I think. It Perhaps you might want to turn off your video and just uh, make your comments uh, orally. I don't know if that will give you some more bandwidth. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? That's better, I think, yes. I was just saying that uh, along the line, uh, I managed to come in and uh, I think the presenters had done their presentation. Or All the same, the other nutrients are important. I don't know if it's uh, unbalanced, where probably uh, the uptake of nitrogen suffers. That's it. I right? go to the need to use the potential of soil to be grown. Add on whatever we give. Balance and nutrients. So, Dr. Eskia, I, I think we're just not able to really hear your uh, your voice at all. So, uh, 
Um, we appreciate your efforts to overcome the technical uh, issues. Um, I would sort of, I think you've, you had prepared some remarks and if you can provide those to us, we'll publish them on the website so that everyone can understand your, uh, your perspective on the, this issue. And I apologize for the technical uh, issues. Uh, Phyllis, are you still there, uh, Phyllis Menz? Okay, so um, there is a question uh, in the box and chat. Uh, is there a plan to share the wealth of experience and results from the project in the three countries we are, we're working in now with other African countries? And what are the associated costs of implementation of 4R in the rest of Africa? I'd say that the short answer is that uh, we are trying to develop a plan. We would like to share that and we, certainly be interested in, in people that like uh, contacting us who would like to uh, have be part of that conversation. Phyllis, thanks for rejoining uh, a question about the role that 4R Solution could play in improving the resilience of women to climate change. And unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, Christy uh, from uh, our project in Ghana to, to overcome technical issues. I'm just wondering, would you have a perspective on the four R's and resilience for women in a, in a world of climate change? Um, well, yes, certainly. Um, the four is um, working very well for the women in, in Ghana, especially those in the areas that's, um, have had a very severe impact uh, that climate change has had a severe impact on. It would really um, be useful, you know, to them. And I, I, I honestly think that if this um, for our principle is spread around the country, if I yesterday, I think one of the presenters said that they had been, there was one person as a director of crop services of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture was quite influential and had been able to get them um, to a point where, you know, policymakers could put, that government could come in. It would be very useful because um, all over the country, in one way or the other, people are, have had the impact of um, climate change. And so it will surely boost um, agri production all over the country to help us with our food security quest. Oh, well, th that's a great answer. Thank you very much. And I, you know, I think uh, that these questions of adaptation and resilience are, are critically important to the whole concept of uh, climate uh, smart uh, Africa. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here to see if there's any other uh, comments. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, I could just ask uh, Guillaume uh, to maybe provide just some of your closing perspectives briefly. And then I think we'll probably move to the, to the wrap up if uh, Jean's available. Okay, uh, thank you very much. No, I think this has been a very interesting discussion. And uh, through the, the work that we implemented, we, we, we see uh, that um, uh, for, for the next uh, three decades, uh, fertilizer use is going to be key uh, to actually achieve uh, the, the food production need for uh, sub-Saharan Africa and the, the way to, 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 to go about it is uh, to actually adopt uh, uh, good nutrient management practices and uh, for us is uh, actually promoting that. So, uh, I mean, I will, but for us cannot just um, uh, go without the support or going through an integrated system uh, where we have a policy and uh, we have a, a research and extension mechanisms uh, around to, to support uh, its implementation. So that will be uh, uh, my, my word for, for the end, yeah, thank you. 
Well, oh, that's great. Well, I, I uh, really am impressed by the work uh, Guillaume and your your team uh, have done in developing the uh, GHG paper. And uh, you know, it is a it uh, styled as a discussion paper. We've had some good discussion about uh, climate change here, but I I hope that if uh, people have comments or questions regarding uh, the paper that uh, Guillaume led, that uh, you can pass that on to us and we'll uh, try and uh, 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 respond. I mean, we, I think we are quite uh, sincere in wanting to spark a conversation about the potential of the four R's and uh, uh, our ability to uh, uh, reduce uh, emissions in, uh, in Africa going into the future. Samuel, I wanna thank you for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, we've had some technical challenges today, but I think despite that, the conversation has been very rich. And I know there's a couple of other questions in the chat that we weren't able to. Um, economics, you know, we're working on the economics of the four hours in Canada. We'll uh, share that work here in, uh, in Africa. And I think that will be uh, a forward looking issue is to look at the the economics, but a lot of there, there is a lot of uh, economics in our program. We've done baseline on uh, on uh, the uh, economic situation of countries of work, and uh, we'll do some reporting on uh, how the four hours has actually uh, improved economics uh, for smallholders. Um, so I think at that, with uh, unfortunately, Jean uh, Roxas from. Uh, uh, IFAD is, was not able to uh, to get into the system, so we'll uh, give Gene another opportunity to, uh, to speak at a future webinar. Uh, and uh, uh, the information from this webinar will be available on our website, which is foroursolution.org. Uh, but there's also information about uh, Boats Project for uh, uh, 4-H uh, Ghana. Uh, the paper that uh, Guillaume uh, has uh, led. Samuel uh, has done a great job and we ran your video, Samuel, on the, uh, uh, the, the field trial results from 2020. But if you wanna find out more about all those uh, results, they're available on the website too. And Phyllis, thank you for jumping in and, uh, and participating so fully. We really appreciate that. And uh, uh, we appreciate the work you do for farmers around the world. And, terms of your uh, participation in the uh, FAO. So I think with that, unless Robin, there's anything else I should be saying? Just to thank you, Clyde, for your extraordinary job of moderating the session and for all of the excellent interventions that we have heard from the speakers and from a very active audience. Thank you. All right, well, let's keep the conversation going. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy your uh, Friday. Okay, thank you. Right.